But before we get started, we're going to ask for a small keynote address from someone who just lit my life up when I got to meet her. This was a few months ago. Her name is Denise Falsman. She's an MD, PhD, Badger. She comes out of the Midwest like myself. I got my high state Buckeye stuff here today for you. In fact, um, Denise, I'll go ahead and give yeah, you one right now. Like you can, Nancy, you can take one Thank and pass you. them down. Um, but she's a director of, um, she basically said Harvard looked at this and said, we got to get you from the Midwest into Harvard because if you're going to figure out a way to prevent type 1 diabetes, we want it to be coming out of Boston, not out of the Midwest. So it's pretty amazing how they were able to pull her in. But she's director of Immunobiology Laboratories at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Leads the most advanced clinical trials in type 1 diabetes, advancing the TNF boosting concept of phase 2. Type 1 diabetic trials using a 100-year-old generic vaccine, BCG, a strong inducer of TNF and Treg cells. So it's amazing. She took this this vaccine has been around forever, and she's turned this thing into something that we are all going to hear about, which is amazing. She's award, awarded National Institutes of Health and National Lab, Library of Medicine, Changing the Face of Medicine Award, the Oprah Achievement Award for Top Health Breakthrough by Female Scientist and the Woman in the, in the Science World from American Medical Women's Association and Wyeth Pharmaceutical Company. So without any further ado, Denise, it's so great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was sitting over in the side saying, these are tough acts to follow, okay? <laughs> so I hope I can provide um, some um, entertainment as well as some data. So I'm going to talk about BCG today just um, so nobody's asleep. It's not Boston Consulting Group, okay? You can't imagine how many times I have BCG on the program. They go, oh, you're going to talk about Boston Consulting Group. So BCG is the oldest and continuously used vaccine in the history of the world. Last year, 100 million infants were vaccinated with BCG. Four billion people have received the vaccine, and it's been continuously used for about 120 years. So we're going to show you the value of this vaccine, not only in our data, but all the global trials going on um, as they relate to the immunomodulatory effects of this very, very old drug. How do I advance the slides? Is there a Did somebody oh, steal the pointer? Is. OK. Green, oh, this is very high tech. That green button. Okay. There you go. Okay. So it's the oldest vaccine on the planet of the Earth. Um, um, it was devised a long time ago. I'll talk to you about how high tech it is. It's the most low tech uh, drug going to be spoken about in two days of this meeting. Um, there's advanced global trials. There's 16 trials going on in Australia, US, Canada, and Europe uh, repurposing this vaccine for diverse forms of autoimmunity for uh, reversal of allergies, and also prevention of infections. We'll show you some of the scientific basis for using this. Um, TB uh, was the number one killer at the turn of the century, but they uh, realized that um, uh, milkmaids never died of tuberculosis. And it was developed as a result of realizing these young girls who milk cows were exposed to another form of bacteria. So it's the avirulent form of uh, TB. In the US, it's only licensed for one indication at very high dose bladder cancer. And um, um, it's, um, if you look at the entire globe, 98% of every human on this planet is vaccinated. But you've never heard about in the US and Europe. And uh, it's a public health policy not to vaccinate and allow you to get TB and treat with antibiotics. We got into using this drug because we thought it was going to be a simple pathway through the FDA, right? 100 year generic drug. So I have a lot of respect for everybody in this room who takes real drugs forward because it's, uh, it's still a haul <laughs> moving forward, 120 year old drug. So these are some of the trials going on. We just had our international meeting in Athens, Greece. Uh, there's a total of 16 trials going on. The most advanced trials are using uh, BCG for the reversal of new onset multiple sclerosis. In yeah, Italy, amazing. we're in phase two yeah, licensure trials at uh, Mass General in type 1 diabetes, reversing established type 1 diabetes. Just so none of you missed the headlines, two weeks ago in the New York Times, there was a big report, again, of the health benefits of BCG. A Danish group um, showed that with three vaccinations in Europe that ceased about 50 years ago, but with public health uh, records, if you got three vaccines and you were a European citizen, you lived 10 years longer. 
Now, why is that? Why is this old-fashioned vaccine changing morbidity and mortality? Well, that group had a little bit of bias because about eight years ago, they went into the um, uh, poorest part of Africa, Bandine, Guinea, and um, uh, decided to really test whether BCG protected from tuberculosis. So they randomized about 200,000 infants, half BCG, half not. We're going to follow them fully for 12 years. They had to stop the trial after three years because in the low birth weight infants that didn't get BCG, 70% higher mortality. So it was those studies that um, made them reflect on really trackable health data in Europe of what does it do to everybody sitting here in the audience. So although I'm going to talk a little bit about type 1 diabetes, you're going to feel a little selfish as you hear this presentation and say, I want to have what they're having. Uh, this was a, a slide on the cover of Science. It was about the hygiene hypothesis about how many of these diseases we're seeing in our society are the result of taking away the environment. I laughed at this picture because it was the milkmaids that got infected with the bovine tuberculosis, a virulent strain. So they were at the other end of the cow. So the picture is um, kind of on the right way, but not totally giving the right message. OK, so what about uh, BCG? And how did we get involved with doing BCG instead of a high-tech drug? Well, it was um, a number of years ago, we published a paper in JCI and a paper in Science saying, for the first time in mice, right? Mice. You know, you got to always have a word of caution when you're talking about mice. But um, when we induce TNF or use the surrogate inducer BCG, we could even take end-stage diabetic mice and permanently reverse type 1 diabetes. So here was this 100-year-old generic drug that was reversing end-stage diabetes never seen before. In the case of the mice, and I always say these are mice, not humans, the pancreas massively regenerated and restored insulin levels. Whether that will occur in humans or not, we don't know. Then the good news was everybody went out to their autoimmune mouse studies, and as somebody said, if you're a mouse, we got you covered. Uh, whether you have lupus or diabetes or multiple sclerosis, uh, BCG is highly efficacious. So we wanted to move this into human clinical trials, and probably in totally uh, synergy with this trial, it's not really smart to go into clinical trials if you got mouse data, but you don't know the people have the same defects. So we spent a long time on biomarker development to prove people with long-standing type 1 diabetes had the bad T cells we could monitor, had too few of the good T cells, and other parameters of the disease progress. So one of the things we tracked were bad T cells. I don't want to show you too much data because everybody else has these glamorous presentations. But effectively, if you're a long-term diabetic, even 15 years out, we can find those bad T cells in there. But importantly, we could show the drug and culture could selectively and only remove the autoreactive T cells. So that became one of our, quote, biomarkers as we move this forward into human clinical trials with the um, supervision of the FDA. We also worked on the good T cells, which are all the rage. If I give a, a lecture over at Harvard Med School, it's always, what are the T regs doing? What are the T regs doing? They used to be called T suppressors, and then there was some data that wasn't quite very, very good, so they changed the name and they became fashionable again. So we can show BCG induces uh, the T reg cells as well. So this is kind of our picture of, of how we view autoimmunity. You've got too many bad cells in the infiltrate. You, you don't have enough good cells. And we think this 100-year-old drug is flipping that balance, as well as other people uh, showing data no, uh, now with a flip balance. But just so you put it in a context, everybody knows the rate of autoimmunity is on the rise globally, the rate of allergies. I mean, whoever grew up with a peanut allergy, OK? The rate of asthma is on the way up. And everybody knows it's the environment. And some people like to blame something toxic in the environment. We like to think about what's been taken away from the environment. And what's really obvious is if you don't have the right mixture of microorganisms, some of these diseases are going to surface. And the oldest organism out there, I'll show you a final slide, is uh, mycobacteria uh, tuberculosis. So we think we have 100,000 years of evolution on our side as we march forward. This is some data. If you get tuberculosis, globally, you don't get type 1 diabetes. It's amazing. If you uh, get a lot of vaccinations and you take away a lot of these diseases that you certainly don't want, 
you get all these other autoimmune diseases. And of course, if you get tuberculosis, you don't get multiple sclerosis. So highly protective, but you're not going to vaccinate people with TB. We've learned a lot of lessons. Talk about collaboration and people working together. The TB field was really the kind of the first group that showed those goombas that people have in their lungs from tuberculosis are little factories of these good T suppressor cells. So it turns out BCG does the same thing as these little factories of tuberculosis. And so we went into human clinical trials. We did a phase one clinical trial, full FDA oversight. These were not investigator trials that are typical of academia. Um, we followed people with long-term diabetes on the impact of two vaccines and followed them for 22 weeks. Remarkably, every single biomarker that we had perfected showed up a positive result. We didn't cure anybody, okay? But we saw the change in the biomarkers which were consistent of the drug eliminating the bad T cells and inducing the good T cells. This just shows some of the data. I see it's too geeky for this audience at this time. But we could see the death of T cells in the peripheral blood. We could also see the induction of TNF. It's known that BCG or tuberculosis induces TNF. We could also see the good uh, T regs. Importantly, and this is of interest to Kevin, we had spent almost six years trying to perfect whether the pancreas was turning back on because you can't measure insulin because the people are taking insulin. So you measure a surrogate called C peptide. Remarkably, the assay out there for C peptide was developed 40 years ago. The primary assay, sorry, you guys, if you're from Roche, was developed by Roche. It not only recognizes C peptide, it recognizes pro insulin, so it's not very good, and had a lower cutoff level of 40. So we worked at perfecting our initial, probably not as good as Kevin can do for sure, but we perfected it to get down to these low levels. So we were very excited when we unblinded the data that we could see the pancreas, these are people 15, 20 years out, make some insulin after BCG. But the real surprise was when the data came in unblinded, the lower limit of the assay showed that even the control group at the start of the trial, as well as the treatment group, had remaining C-peptide. Remember what we've told everybody. I'm an endocrinologist. We told everybody that you get the disease, you go you talk about doctors telling you things. Um, and you're you're going to get the disease. You're going to have this honeymoon. You're going to have a little bit of pancreas function for a year or so, and then your pancreas is dead. Here it was. By making the assay more sensitive, we were showing that people 15, 20 years out with this disease still had a live pancreas making insulin. Small amounts, but making insulin. So we've worked a lot on trying to perfect those assays. The top graph just shows you um, where the normal cutoff was uh, for, for um, sensitive C peptide assays. Can you guys see that? Okay. So here, where up, it was around 40 or so. So this is all people knew about. So it obviously looked like the disease stopped. But now we know the decay of the pancreas goes over uh, decades, not just that uh, one time interval. And then um, um, as a humorous story, two years after this report, I'm in England at the European diabetes meeting. And um, a, a British fellow who had just gotten his PhD done came running up to me, ready to hug me. OK, now that's a paradox in and of itself. But, but <laughs> the funny thing was he said, Dr. Felser, I have good news and I have bad news. And I said, well, what's the good news? And he says, well, I've been collecting urine for C-peptide in Scotland, Ireland, and Great Britain looking for fat type 2 diabetics that you know, have C-peptide issues. And instead, I kept finding C-peptide in kids with type 1 diabetes that had it for 15, 20 years. So this is really good. So I hug him back. And he goes, well, you want to hear the bad news? I said, OK, what's the bad news? Did I tell you the story yeah. before? Yeah. So what's the bad news? And he says, well, you know, I got done with my thesis. I totally wrote it. Um, I went before the review board. And the most senior person in all Great Britain sat there and said, you got two damn bloody assays not working now. So there was like this resistance of the scientific community to believe the paradigm of this disease was just wrong. So this slide just shows you now a lot of people are finding C peptide. So this is the textbook picture. You can find it in any medical textbook, the top one. New England Journal of Medicine about five years ago wrote a review article, you know, the pancreas is dead within a year. And so now we've really changed that paradigm by developing better assays that the pancreas can live on for decades, not functionally, not fully functionally, but it's not quite dead. 
Um, we also know these C-peptides, um, which is very important for getting uh, FDA approval for these new things, uh, correlates uh, with the duration, but importantly, it correlates with hemoglobin A1C, the control of blood sugar. So a little bit of C-peptide is really valuable for keeping your diabetes under control. The trials that are going on with BCG um, are going on diverse autoimmune diseases. This uh, data was published uh, from Italy. And what it, uh, they looked for new onset MS. They, have, of course, did CAT scans, and they did um, as well as uh, relapsing rate. And what they showed was BCG as two vaccines was better than the standard of care. The good news is the effect appears to be permanent. The bad news is it takes about one or two years for the systemic effect to show up on MRI scans. So that sets the stage, really, for all of us doing trials in allergy, diabetes, and other autoimmune diseases. We have three clinical programs going on at the Mass General trying to uh, uh, get licensure of this cheap, generic, safe uh, drug for autoimmunity. We also got another very large donation uh, from uh, a person interested in fibromyalgia. To date, we're not as good as you, but we've raised $50 million nonprofit to get these trials moving. So um, it's a huge effort of the generosity of the public of wanting change in healthcare. Um, our uh, current trials of phase two, six vaccines fully enrolled. We're about a year into that five-year period. Um, as an example, we picked the toughest endpoint, so we're pretty serious, a change in hemoglobin A1C. Not to get too geeky, but we do epigenetics because the question comes up, why in multiple sclerosis, why for morbidity and mortality do you see such lasting effects of BCG? Well, it's now pretty obvious for those of us working in the tuberculosis community, as well as with this vaccine, BCG permanently changes your methylation patterns of some of the most important T signature genes. So what we're able to now show is for the six most important signature genes for T reg cells, within eight weeks after a vaccination, two vaccinations of BCG, we can see um, uh, systemic changes in the methylation. So we think these kind of mechanisms, these are all the genes we track for methylation, are going to give us a clue of why these vaccines take a while to kick in, but then their effect lasts decades. That's more data. I don't want to bore you guys. More mRNA data. Lots of data. Okay. So my point here is that old drugs can have really important purposes if you have the mechanism of action and you know biomarkers to track efficacy. So this has um, changed our view of these are some of the first trials in type 1 diabetes trying to reverse the disease when you have the disease. Up until now, all drug development, talk about frustration, has only been in new onset diabetics or pre-diabetics because they thought it was too hard to tackle people with end-stage disease. So we, um, because of the generosity of the public, have decided to tackle the people who are most deserving of something affordable and maybe efficacious. Um, people send me many slides, um, so one of the themes here is get dirty, okay? And um, um, dirt is good, so if you have kids, get them in the backyard, get that dirty dog your husband wanted, and um, uh, make sure they get a lot of exposure uh, to the environment. And last but not least, we really are all thinking who work in this field that we've got something really good, but it's really Mother Nature that has something good, because you probably heard the story um, uh, two years ago, the paper was published in Science, that these spearlunkers in France were going down these caves, and they looked over, and they felt, saw this shriveled up guy, and they thought, oh, how unfortunate somebody 70 years ago, 100 years ago, fell down that cave. Well, he fell down that cave 90,000 years ago. So he was the best freeze-dried Neanderthal anybody had ever found. So everybody went after the DNA. We got to get the DNA out. We got to really see where our roots and origins are. Well, they went to sequence the DNA, and they kept sequencing and sequencing and sequencing. They kept coming up with one thing, mycobacteria. So there's no doubt that um, mycobacteria um, is the oldest co-evolutionary organism that set our genes and we set its genes. So with you know, 90,000 years of evolution, we've gotten rid of genes we don't need because it regulates our genes. And it's gotten rid of genes that we regulate their genes. So now you've lost those genes. You remove mycobacteria from drinking water. 
um, or from being a farmer in, in the soil, and all of a sudden you have a different reset in the immune system. So all these people seeing uh, beneficial effects in trials are now really working on this hygiene hypothesis and trying to reintroduce this very, very old vaccine for many human conditions. So that's my story. Thanks for listening. Thank you for inviting me.